So we spent the last six videos looking at the electric fields created by charge distributions. Today I want to take a look at the electric potential created by uh, one of these charge distributions. Um, electric field is useful and it is important, but it's kind of difficult to work with because it's a vector quantity. We don't really have a way of measuring it directly. In a lot of applications, it's more useful to measure the electric potential, um, which we sometimes colloquially call the voltage. I know there are uh, semantic differences between um, voltage and electric potential, but you can, you can think of it as a voltage. Um, and not lose too much uh, meaning to it. Uh, electric potential is a lot easier to work with because it goes like one over R instead of like one over R squared for a point charge. And that makes the integrals a little bit easier. It's also a scalar quantity. It's just a number instead of being a vector. So you only keep track of one thing instead of three things. And we can actually measure it to some degree because we can measure voltages. What I've got here is a contour plot of the electric potential of a dipole. So we've got a positive charge over here on the left. We've got a negative charge over here on the right. And what you're seeing in these uh, little uh, ear-shaped patterns are what we call equipotential lines. So equi means same. So these are curves that all of, of all the points that have the same value of electric potential. The red ones represent positive values of the potential and the blue ones represent negative values of the potential. You can see that the negative values are coming off closer to the negative charge, positive values are coming off closer to the positive charge. Uh, basically, you can think of this as the hilliness of the system. So you can think of red as meaning the thing is going uphill toward this charge. You can think of the blue as meaning the, the electric potential is going downhill toward this charge. And you could, in principle, set these up in 3D into shells, but I've just set them up as, as two-dimensional uh, curves for right now. So what I want to do is show you how I made these curves, because it's not a trivial thing to do in vPython. It takes a little bit of of setting up to do. And then at the end of today's video, I want to add in the, ele the electric field arrows to show you how the electric field relates to the electric potential. So if we come over here to the code, uh, we've got our two source charges over here. Uh, we've got them uh, with, uh, with plus and minus charges. So they've got charges equal in magnitude but opposite in sign. We've got our dipole separation distance S here. So they're each at S over 2 and negative S over 2. And here we're setting up all of the points we're interested in. So we're actually calculating the electric potential at all of the points within a 50 S, uh, excuse me, within a 100 S by 100 S square. So going out to negative 50 times S to positive 50 times S along the X axis and then the same thing in the Y axis. So we're actually calculating a lot more uh, electric potential values than we're showing on the diagram. Um, and so we, we add all of these observation points to our list points. So points here represents the observation points. Um, and here we're calculating the potential at each one. So we loop over the number of observation, the list of observation points, and then we loop over the list of sources, just like we've done before in calculating the electric field. Only this time we're calculating the electric potential. And don't let that V fool you. We're not supposed to call it voltage, even though we use the, use the symbol V for it. Um, so here we're calculating using the uh, electric potential of a point charge. It's just 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the charge divided by the distance uh, from the source point to the field point, uh, not squared. So the main difference here is this is not a vector. There's no R hat being tacked on, and it's 1 over R to the first power, not 1 over R squared. And so once we calculate that electric potential, we're adding that to a list of potential values here. So we've got our list of points and our corresponding list of potentials. It's at that point we're going to make the contours. So here we're making uh, we're calling on a new function that we'll define below called make contour. It takes two arguments. One is the value of the potential that you want to make this contour of, and then the other is the color that you want the contour plot to have. Uh, we'll skip over the commented section here. That's for later. Here we define the function make contour. So it takes in the voltage and the color. And we set up a tolerance because we are basically what we're doing is looking for the points in this list that have a 
uh, they have an electric potential value equal to V contour. Now you're not going to find one that is exact, right? We're working with floating point numbers. There's rounding errors. There, there's a finite, you know, step size in the grid. So we set up just a little tolerance to say we want all of the points that have an electric potential value within this much of the of the of the given value. And so we, we set up a new list for contour points. These are the locations that we are going to be uh, uh, adding to our, to our contour curve. Let me show you what becomes of this, of this list of points. Um, after we do a sort, we'll talk about the sort in just a second, um, we come down here, we use the curve function. The curve function is what I'm, I'm starting to learn how to use in vPython. I plan to release a tutorial about it uh, uh, in a little bit. Um, but basically with a curve, you're, you're giving vPython a set of points, so you're giving this list of positions and a color, and it goes in the order of this list of positions and creates lines in between each of those points to create the, the curve here of this color. So if you take a look back at our result here, if you zoom in, you can see there's some jaggedness to this. That's because these are the individual points that are in the list, and then it's creating this line segment in between it. So it's getting a little more smooth or a little smoother out here um, as the points get closer together, but here the points are farther apart, so it's becoming a little bit jagged. And in fact, if you've used the make trail option in your animations, uh, this is how the make trail is made, is using this contour object. Um, but in order to do that, in order to get it going around the circle, we have to sort these points, and that's where this, uh, this sorting business comes in. And in order to sort this correctly, we have to be able to go around the circle, meaning we need to be able to go through each quadrant. So what we're doing is we're looking at all of the points that are in the first quadrant, X and Y both greater than zero. Then we look at all the points that are in the second quadrant, X less than zero, Y greater than zero. Then we look at all the points that are in the third quadrant, x and y both less than zero. And finally, we look at all the points that are in the fourth quadrant, x and y, x greater than zero, y less than zero. And basically we sort them by their angle within that quadrant. So we calculate an angle for, uh, for each of these uh, points. Um, we're, I'm, I'm separating them into the angles for each quadrant because uh, you can get messed up depending on where you're measuring zero from and what is a positive angle and what is a negative angle. And so it's just easier to kind of brute force your way through it and go through each um, quadrant individually. So we get all of these uh, different lists that have the angle and the point. And then we do a little sort here. So this is a bubble sort. This is an algorithm that I got off of uh, python3.codes. Um, so I'll include, a, I'll include this link in the description below. But this is your basic sort of keep looping over until uh, you have everything in the right order. So we're sorting it based on the angles. So the first array is the, or the first list, excuse me, is the list that you want sorted in numerical order. And so that's why we're calculating each of these individually so that we don't end up going back and forth between different quadrants all over the place. And then here we've got our list of points. So it's sorting the list of points according to their angles within each quadrant. And then once we have each of those sorted, we just add them together. So we just take the angles in quadrant one, and then we append to that the angles in quadrant two, then we append to that the angles in quadrant three, and then append to that the angles in quadrant four. So when you have lists like this, you can just add them and it just appends the list together, keeps them in the appropriate order. Then we do the same thing with the contour points so that we can get all of our contour points together. Then we're ready to create our curve. Uh, oh, and this last point here, we're adding on the, uh, this last uh, append here, we're adding on the first point again at the end so that the thing will close back in on itself. Otherwise you have a little gap at the end there. And so then finally we can create this curve. So a lot of work goes into creating this contour plot. We have to calculate the potential everywhere. And then we have to, uh, to sort all of the, we, we have to sift out all the values that have the right, uh, excuse me, we have to sift out all the locations that have the right potential value, and then we have to sort those and then get them into this curve. So a lot of work goes into making uh, these little earlobe things. The good news is we can change up the charge distribution and just repeat the same process because there's nothing in the sorting or in the, the contour plot generation that depends on the, uh, on the source charges. And now let's get to the point that I have been waiting for. I just tried this out this morning and it worked and I'm very happy. Um, here I've copied and pasted in the uh, code for creating the electric field. 
So here uh, we're creating our set of observation points again in a circle going around the charge distribution. And we're going out to a distance of eight times the dipole distance. That's gonna put our electric field arrows somewhere around here. And I'll show you why that's important in just a second. So let's run this with control two. All right, and here we've got the same contour plot. We haven't changed anything about that. And here we've added in the electric field vectors. And what's cool about this is you can see the relationship between electric field and electric potential. The way these two work together is that the electric field vector always points perpendicular to the equipotential lines. It always points perpendicular to these contours because it's always rolling downhill. If you've had calc three or any sort of vector calculus, the electric field is the negative gradient of the electric potential. And so these electric field lines are always gonna be pointing downhill. So the positive charge represents a very sharp uphill. So the electric field kind of rolls downhill away from here. The negative charge represents a very sharp downhill. So all the electric field lines kind of roll into here. And in between, you've got a, a neat little area where you've been rolling downhill, you're rolling downhill over this way, and so you get this turn in the electric field. So this kind of helps you visualize this turn in the electric field that happens uh, when you get um, parallel to the dipole itself. So this is really cool. Um, the, the code for this is available in the description below. I invite you to change up the electric uh, uh, charge distribution here in the center. Now, just a fair warning, you do have to do a bit of adjustment for the electric field arrows to get them to show up. So that's where that scale factor uh, comes in handy. But I think at this point we've seen um, plenty of examples of working with uh, electric fields and electric potential. Uh, in our next video, we're gonna start taking a look at magnetic fields and how we can visualize those based on creating currents in our simulation. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.